Good morning and welcome to Bar Talk. I'm Natalie Ruland, the scholar in residence of the Washington Ballet. Thank you for joining us for the seventh episode of our eight part digital series on dance. Thank you to our artistic director, Julie Kent, the staff of the Washington Ballet, our donors and subscribers, and the generous support of the Ballet Tomont Society for bringing this series to life and for enabling the Washington Ballet to survive and thrive during this challenging period. Welcome to our April edition of Bar Talk. As we've mentioned during our previous episodes, Fridays have a special significance in the Washington Ballet history as co-founders Lisa Gardner and Mary Day hosted an intimate series of ballet evenings called Fridays at Nine during World War II. So we hope you'll continue to join us for our exclusive behind the scenes conversations every month on Fridays at 10. Last month, Julie and I hosted a fascinating conversation with choreographers Dana Genshaft and Jessica Lang. Today, April 9, would have been the premiere of the Washington Ballet's production of Swan Lake. And in honor of that, we're thrilled to have the Washington Ballet Associate Director, Victor Barbie, here to talk today about Swan Lake and the legacy of Marius Petipa on the contemporary stage. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, our dear friend and colleague, Oberlin Professor Emeritus, Dr. Tim Scholl, will not be able to join us today, but he remains with us in spirit. Swan Lake is above all a ballet of remembrance. The original 1877 ballet with musical score by Pyotr Tchaikovsky and choreography by Czech ballet master Julius Reisinger was set around a lake of tears. While many details of the libretto and staging have changed in the 144 years since the ballet premiered in Moscow, the Lake of Memory remains an iconic image of ballet history and the transformative power of art. The Swan Lake that we recognize today dates back to the 1895 production in St. Petersburg with choreography by Marius Petipa and Lev Ivanov and remains the most famous and frequently performed of the classical ballet canon. The canonic Petipa Ivanov Swan Lake depicts the ill-fated love of Prince Siegfried and the Swan Queen Odette. The ballet transpires against the backdrop of the enchanted lake and the machinations of the demonic von Rothbart, who holds the swans by day, maidens by night, under a spell. The first act represents the bon vivant milieu of the hunter hero, Prince Siegfried, and reveals his preference for the pleasurable pursuits of youth over the feudal obligations of a noble marriage. The second act portrays the supernatural swan world of Odette, in which ideal love between a mortal man and a magical maiden becomes a tantalizing possibility that is poetically sealed with the prince's promise. The third act represents the clash of these two worlds at the ball, during which Siegfried breaks his vow to Odette by agreeing to wed von Rothbart's glamorous daughter Odile, who has disguised herself as Odette. And finally, the fourth act returns to the community of swan maidens along the shores of the lake, this act underscores the binding power of Siegfried and Odette's love and dramatizes the fatal consequences of the prince's infidelity, the watery demise of the doomed lovers made immortal. Swan Lake has been dazzling Washington audiences since the 1950s, when the Washington Ballet danced alongside American Ballet Theater and New York City Ballet guest stars to the accompaniment of the National Symphony Orchestra. The current Washington Ballet production of Swan Lake by Julie Kent and Victor Barbie draws on this rich history of the ballet. In addition to the Stepanov choreographic notation preserved in the Harvard Theater Library and the original Russian librettos from the St. Petersburg Theater Library, the Washington Ballet's Swan Lake synthesizes elements of staging and storing from the international repertoire. Julie and I are very honored to welcome our special guest today to share with us the timeless beauty of Swan Lake. <laughs> Victor Barbie currently serves as the Associate Director of the Washington Ballet. He previously held the prestigious post of Associate Director of American Ballet Theater, where he acted in numerous capacities from principal dancer to ballet master during his tenure from 1975 until 2015. Victor received his training at the North Carolina School of the Arts, the School of American Ballet, and the fabled Kirov Ballet School in then Leningrad. His repertoire includes not only over 100 classical ballets, but also performances on Broadway, television, and the feature films The Turning Point and Dancers with his longtime friend, Mikhail Baryshnikov, and his wife, Julie Kent. Good morning, Julie and Victor. How are you? Good morning, Natalie. Good morning, Natalie. We're well. So nice to see you as ever. Thank so you nice for to see you. And thanks for the kind words. Well, Keep thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. It's so lovely to see you both together. Now, I've heard that you're back in the studio. Congratulations on the dancers' return to the studio. How is that going? Beautifully, very inspiring. Um, 
to see them in their milieu and uh, continuing to pursue their their art, their craft. It's a really inspiring time. We're very grateful um, for this shift in the uh, in the pandemic. It's certainly not easy physically after a year, but of course they've all been, you know, they've been dancing in their living rooms and doing virtual classes and which is nothing like being in a real studio. So it's difficult, but it's very inspiring. They're so tired and so sore and so happy at the same time that it's, <laughs> it's uh, pretty amazing. Very inspiring. The last time I remember being in the studio was of course the fateful final rehearsal of Swan Lake on March 13. And I think, Julie, we actually have a video um, that you've made of, of some of the images from Swan Lake. Let's take a look at Swan Lake in rehearsal from last year. Yes, beautiful. The final scene especially gives me chills. It's so beautiful. And I remember all of the complicated machinations of the maypole, of the formation of the, the maiden, trying to organize all of that. So <laughs> it's wonderful to see that. Yes. Yeah. Very, very complex, but exciting. And such a committed group um, that rep represents the entire Washington Ballet organization, as you could see from uh, the video, we have the students in our school and the professional training division, our studio company, our company. And uh, so everybody was so excited and and uh, committed to this hour staging. And I think just the that will only be amplified and, and magnified when we do have our premiere uh, in early spring 2021. Mm -hmm. So uh, very, very excited for, for that moment. I think just all, all the, uh, there'll be so much emotional energy uh, put into that production. So really excited for I it. I think there's something like 30, 32 scenes in the production and there are about a hundred roles that need to be danced. Of course, dancers do multiple roles throughout right. with that and third, et cetera. But it's a lot to put together, and we were we were really just about that close to having it ready to go. Other than sort of the magic that you put it into the theater and costumes and lighting and live music and all the all the other things that you add on that really bring the magic to life. But um, so we're just on hold. 
who you both have performed in so many different productions of Swan Lake. And I know you bring all of that sort of rich knowledge, practical knowledge of stylistic interpretation and you know artistry to your own new production of Swan Lake. Julie, I know you performed in the Mikhail Baryshnikov, the David Blair, and the Kevin McKenzie productions of Swan Lake. Could you tell us a little bit about those different productions? Sure. So <clears throat> my very first production of Swan Lake uh, was a new staging by Mikhail Baryshnikov in 1988. So here we have a photo from, this was the fourth act, um, and uh, the he chose to uh, go with it, um, a real focus on the swan maiden aspect of um, the story in that we didn't have feathers. We were, uh, and also we, in the fourth act, there were the black swan signets. So you see I'm in all black there. And uh, along with the white swans. And at the end of the ballet, we were returned to our women form. So we were released from the spell and turned back from uh, enchanted swans back into maidens. Um, in that piece, I, I danced in the, I was a signet in the second act. So that famous dance, um, this was at the beginning of my career. And so I, I grew about two inches from the time I joined the company at age 16 to age 20. So at that time I was one of the smaller dancers. And so I was a signet, I was in the waltz of act one, um, a, a fiance they were called in the third act, um, danced the pas de trois as well. So many, many wrote, there's the pas de trois, sort of went through the ranks as far as um, uh, different uh, dances. There's with Ross Stretton in the third act. So yeah, it was a very interesting uh, for my first production to be one that was created uh, mm -hmm. on the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a fascinating process, a lot of patience, um, but it was not, uh, it was uh, created in 1988 and Bershenkoff left in 1990. And so mm -hmm. we did not perform that production very often. And then the next production was uh, Kevin's staging of the David Blair production, mm -hmm. which was American Ballet Theater's first one like production and, and Victor, that was his first one like as well. So this is the second act. Um, uh, when I was uh, not my first year dancing the Swan Queen, but early on in the mid nineties, that's with Vladimir Malakoff there. Mm -hmm. um, I believe at the Metropolitan Opera House. Um, and so that, that, and this is the o Odile, the third act. Um, so the, in this production, I made my de debut as Odette Odile. I also danced the pas de trois, um, but it's where I, I really um, sort of assumed the role of the ballerina. And I, I gave my first um, sort of bar talk mm -hmm. uh, with um, Susan Jaffe and Cynthia Gregory. So mm -hmm. all three Swan Queens were uh, interviewed and it was Cynthia Gregory's sort of final season. Susan Jaffe was in the, in the middle of her career and I had just made my debut. So it was quite an interesting conversation that um, I think I, I li listened much more than uh, had to contribute, but it was fascinating, so. And then you also start in Kevin's as well? Right, so then Kevin McKenzie's production premiered actually at the Kennedy Center in 2000, I believe. And I was the opening night cast as the Swan Queen with Angel Correa as the Prince. Here, here I am with Marcela Gomez uh, in that role and there with Jose Carreño, Jose Manuel Carreño. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is the production that uh, ABT is continues to dance 20, 21 years later. Um, very as uh, is it Zach Brown mm -hmm. that did the costumes and sets? Uh, very big production, um, very exciting. So, uh, and then I also danced Swan Lake um, as a guest artist ar around around the world and. Uh, sort of notably in, in Finland with the Imperial Russian Ballet, uh, mm -hmm. which is where I met Maya Plisitskaya. So I know we're gonna speak about that at mm -hmm. some point. And Victor, I know you had mentioned there was a particularly interesting tale from Julie's final Swan Lake performance. Well, 
<laughs> Gosh, do we have to go there? It gets me, <laughs> makes me sweat as we speak. So you see this photo, that's me in the back as the master of ceremonies, who was also the tutor from act one. And of course, Julian Black Swan. And it, it's not at this exact moment, but a little bit later in the third act, I'm standing in the same place and Julie's doing the famous foites, which are 32 turns on one foot. Um, and it's kind of a hallmark of a ballerina's technical prowess and very difficult and takes immense concentration. And there was, I can see it now, there was someone at about 11 o'clock in the fifth row, so almost directly in front of Julie, taking video, and the red light on the camera was blinking, and not even was it blinking in time with the music. It was completely out of sync with the music, and so I was, I was with one eye was going, stop doing that, and with the other eye was going, keep going, Julie, and don't let it distract you, and, and uh, don't follow the blinking of the camera, follow the beat of the conductor, and you know, there's there's plenty that can potentially go wrong under the best of circumstances, much less with having somebody basically shining a laser in your eyes while, while you're trying to turn in your final performance, which everyone's going to remember. So someone out there has a video and we'd like to have it back, please. <laughs> it would like to be returned. That's right. 3515 Northwest, exactly. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> now, Julie, you mentioned in preparation for this double role, the Odette Odile role, you were coached by various fabled ballerinas, Russian ballerinas, Maya Pletetskaya, Natalia Makarova, and also the famous English ballerina, Georgina Parkinson. Could you tell us about those experiences? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, Georgina Parkinson was <clears throat> my, my mentor. She was my coach. Um, she uh, she sort of helped me to be become a ballerina. I was also very influenced by Victor and his tutelage and also Kevin McKenzie. I mean, and, and many people, but Georgina sort of picked me out uh, as a very, as a teenager and um, worked with me very intensely with a, a, a lot of love and exactitude and um, maternal ownership. And uh, we, we took every part of that, every step of that ballet apart, put it back together every year. You know, it, was, uh, it wasn't just we, we, create, we um, had one approach and that was the approach for each season. It was a constant process of let's take this apart and let's put it back together again. Um, and she, you know, she had a very unique experience growing up uh, in the Royal Ballet School, being the youngest principal dancer in their history. And at her uh, funeral memorial, um, Anthony Dow, Sir Anthony Dow, uh, shared an interesting story about um, their debut in Swan Lake. That um, the you know the management at the time thought it would be great to put the two young stars together and uh anthony said it was the, the worst decision ever because they were both so young and inexperienced and they were both very nervous mm -hmm. very nervous and then the idea was oh well let's have them make their debut outside of uh, the, the opera Royal Opera House, which again, they said, you know, all the comfort and security of your home and your theater and everything. So they made their debut in some small city in, 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 in the UK. And uh, I, it was a, well, he tells the story very, very wittily, but uh, there was a lot of shaking and, and nerves <laughs> to be had. Um, but she had just such an incredible, um, knowledge through that and that royal ballet um history which I, I, as you know is where the notation first went before it found its way uh into the harvard harvard library so um and then you know natasha makarova um known throughout the world as one of the greatest uh, swan queens in history unique beautiful moving Absolutely, like it, just thinking about it, I get goosebumps of, of especially with Ivan Naj. There's a beautiful rec recording of their performance, uh, and Victor's in this recording uh, for, from American Ballet Theater, I think 1976. So much love, so much beauty. Uh, it's just 
incredible uh, ballerina. And, you know, Natasha didn't work too much with me specifically on Swan Lake, but she obviously worked intensely with me on La Bayadere, which was her production at ABT, and also on Sleeping Beauty, which, mm -hmm. you know, her coaching was is always very um, motivated by the drama. Um, she, she just would always remind me that Aurora was French, right? So everything had to have a sort of French sophistication and nuance about it. Um, and uh, her, her her approach was, was, again, very motivated on where the drama was coming from. Uh, I think that that was part of what, uh, when she left the Soviet Union and came to uh, the West, um, all of that, uh, uh, all of the other influences of theater and acting and drama and different kinds of movement really sort of opened up her artistry in a way that, it, that she, she was a. Um, she shared that so much in her coaching. Now, Maya Plisetskaya, I met uh, in Finland when I was dancing with the um, Imperial Russian Ballet. Mm -hmm. uh, by coincidence, that's when I met Alexei Ratmansky as well. Uh, they they were performing together in Nijinsky's Afternoon of a Fawn. So she was well into her 80s and playing the nymph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Ratmansky was playing the fawn, Nijinsky's role. Um, and uh, they had several performances. Uh, it was a mixed rep and we were doing Swan Lake uh, most, I had did four Swan Lakes in a row, which was a big milestone for me. And then in the matinee performances, there was some repertoire. And um, uh, Plitsetskaya, you know, she, uh, I would say that the, the greatest thing that she told me was, um, and not, not surprising being a Soviet ballerina, the impact of different uh, steps for the audience. So she would always say, you know, do the circle, the do the menage, it, the audience loves it, you know, you'll get more applause instead of doing a diagonal. And so there were a few uh, parts of my, um, the choreography that I changed just uh, out of respect uh, for her suggestion. And I thought that was just interesting to hear from her about how um, how she, she would approach different, because as we know, there's many different versions of how you put circles, diagonals, how you arrange the steps, and that her um, her understanding of it was really impacted by the audience response, so. It's fascinating to hear about all of the different interpretations of these petit bas ballets that are still in the repertory and the way they've come through Royal Ballet, as you mentioned, the Sergeyev collection going there first. And then, you know, also with ABT, American Ballet Theater really retained so much of that repertoire because of the infusion of Russian emigre dancers. So it's so amazing that you've had exposure to that. And that's part of your lineage that you're now passing on to Washington Ballet. Um, Victor, I know you also have danced extensively in Swan Lake. How many roles have you performed, would you say? Um, I think 11. 11, oh my all God. Of the, all of the male roles, which include the peasants and the aristocrats and Ben O and the Tudor and the Prince and von Rothbart and the Mazurka, the Chardosh, the Neapolitan, the Spanish dance, and maybe left something out. I was also the dog walker for the aristocrats in act one it was one of my favorite things this beautiful huge brindle great dame that i used to take around in a circle they were like is anyone uh, comfortable walking a giant dog and i was like me me it was one of the highlights of my career that was my first year in abt and i just loved to to uh bring that magnificent animal on stage and the and the dogs loved it so much they were a little bit tail down in the first rehearsal. And by the time the performances came, you practically had to drag them off the stage because they could feel the same thing that the performers feel, the sort of the energy and the magic coming across the footlights from what we call that fourth wall out there where the audience sits. So um, I did do quite a, a number of roles and it gives you an education and experience from various points of view. So. I'm able to see the uh, able to see the ballet in, in performance or in the preparation period from the point of view of the sort of the smallest role 
to the biggest role in the ballet and it gives you a perspective of how important each role is. And if you're the third guy on the left with the flag, you should be the best third guy on the left holding the flag that ever was because at any point in a performance, somebody in the theater is looking at you mm -hmm. and you have to be engaged and you and what you're doing for from your own perspective or from what the audience gets from it has to be as important as anything else, as the foites, for instance. Exactly. And Victor, you once mentioned in a rehearsal that anytime a dancer hears the musical score of a ballet, that just hearing that music, your entrance music, that your body has sort of a physical memory of, of the dance that you've performed. So what is it like to have performed such a spectrum of roles and now to be staging Swan Lake when you were staging it last year and hearing the score? I mean, do you just remember every role you've ever danced or, or how do you sort of navigate I don't that? relate to it quite that way, Natalie. Mm -hmm. I never have, but I relate to it about what it felt like. That's mm -hmm. how I always did my, my characters and my performances. So I remember the feeling, mm -hmm. which is, a wonderful thing to do. I don't have that kind of remember rem memory that I remember every step I did 45 years ago. Right. But when I hear the music, I get the feeling immediately that I used to have, whether it's the carriage of a Chardash dancer or the sort of the a panache of a Spanish dancer, or there's a fantastic moment. It depends on what production you're doing, of course, but there's a fantastic moment in act Three, in Act Four, after the betrayal happens at the castle, and the and the prince runs back into the forest, and there's this huge timpani build up for the music, and he runs into the scene, and it's both uh, so exciting and so sad and so bittersweet and so full of um, hope and expectation and despair all at the same time, and to be sitting out front and be able to enjoy that same feeling and that same emotion. That's what I feel like I can replicate. Of course, you can tell somebody how to feel when they're when you're coaching the role, but you want to lead them up to the point that they are completely engaged in their character and they 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 their guiding light is their emotional um, perspective. Um, and then, of course, you put that in tandem with where you need to be on the stage and where you need to be in the music and with consideration for your partner and others on stage. But you do have to know exactly where you are and how many times I sat out front and some entrance music would come on and I felt like I had to jump out of my seat. It's like one of those bad dreams where you think you missed an entrance <laughs> and the music would start coming up and I'm like, I'm not in the right place at the right time because I'm sitting out front and you literally almost jump out of your seat to get back into the wing so you can make your entrance and then you just calm yourself down. But there's that much of a sort of a visceral, emotional response to the music. And so that's what drives me in, in the studio is to see if I can help the dancers to more than with the steps. The steps are a technical thing and the choreography is a different thing. And Julie has a better sense of how to do choreography than I do. Um, but I have a good sense of what we're trying to accomplish. So I, I try to impart that, but from the performer's point of view, not from my point of view. Exactly. So Julie, talking about your sense of the choreography. So you've danced clearly just as Victor. You haven't, maybe not 11 roles, but you know, you've come up through, you know, from the core to finally um, to Odette Odile. So how has this given you a unique perspective on staging Swan Lake for contemporary audiences, particularly bearing in mind your interest you've expressed before on communities of women. And we have, of course, this community of Swan Maidens. Right. Well, I think that's an interesting link there uh, because I've danced all the roles in point shoes, right? So all those <laughs> communities of women roles. And so I think that, um, you know, that that is something that um, I find so beautiful about, uh, well, Swan Lake, but all of the, the Petty Pop Ballets is those group, the, the women's groups and um, especially as a woman but also as somebody who's danced all those roles and 
love them and understand how they really are um, the heart of the, the entire experience. And it just supports, it creates this beautiful um, uh, just framework and, and support system for the story to be told. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I love working um, with, I love working with all the dancers, but in, in all those scenes with the women. And I think that one thing that I think for audiences um, to understand that, that we've talked about with the dancers is that a court of ballet or when you're working all, on ensemble, it's not that you want everybody to look the same or everybody has to look alike or, you know, but what, you, what is the beauty is when you see all these artists on the same page. And so everybody is working towards the same goal. Um, and that is what, as an audience, when you see everybody taking a breath at the same time or matching their movement, their lines, so that all the lines are magnified as opposed to condensed to one, you know, one person, it's sort of, it, it just, it's an uh, incredible effect that mm -hmm. Petty Pot developed of all these women. Um, and, and the pride that, uh, the pride that you feel when as a group, you know you have done just something almost miraculous. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very special feeling. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a joy. And uh, it's, I, I think that it's with that spirit that I am part the, the staging. And, um, and hopefully um, that's, you know, the, the, when, when all of our dancers now in years to come will be talking about um, this production and the productions, the Sleeping Beauty, Giselle, that mm -hmm. we, Lee Sophie that we've worked on, that they, they'll remember, you know, that that will be the essence of, of the memory. Well, speaking of all of these communities of women and the Swan Maidens, I know we talked a lot in your office about, you know, the original 1877 version of the ballet. The Swan Maidens were just magical creatures sort of happily cavorting by the lake. And then later in 1895 with Petipa and Ivana, then, then you have the introduction of the Swan Maidens as these sort of tragic figures who are trapped under the spell of von Rothbard. So how did you navigate some of these, you know, historical origins, the two different librettos in creating your own version for the Washington Ballet. Right. Well, you know, you and I had so many wonderful, fascinating conversations when you helped in introduce me to all the, the, the things that you wouldn't, how things got to be where they are. You know, you have to walk back and look at the original intentions that um, as we discovered the, the Von Rothbart figure originally was a woman. So mm -hmm. it wasn't the big bad man sort of uh, putting a spell on the women who were then victimized. They were magical creatures, right? And the, the villain was a, a raven. A woman raven, and then the the grandfather kept watch over the maidens, and um, the it, the Odile was never a black swan. It was just a glamorous woman, right? Um, who did not originally wear black, but wore sort of red multicolor, right? Multicolors. Right. So, I mean, I think there was a lot of interesting. Um, original uh, intent that, that you helped um, unlock and, and we pondered over. But then you also understand that over time, um, an audience attaches uh, itself to a story, right? Mm -hmm. And that it, at some point it has to be easy to understand. It can't be uh, so complex um, that that you you lose the the gist, right? <laughs> Why you're there. Um, and especially the mime scenes where in the, the lakeside mime scenes that tell the entire story so beautifully, um, it, it, they would have, we would have had to change so much of what is, has become sort of what Swan Lake represents to, to the 20th uh, and 21st century audiences. So, um, you know, as we we ha still haven't finalized our libretto because um, as we did with Sleeping Beauty, we wanted to continue to 
create and and see how the process continues to evolve and then once you make it then you say oh let now it's easy to find the words that that uh, tell all the story so that's a there's a lot there that i'm really excited to dive back into with you with victor with the dancers as we build our our production that again is sort of supported by all the history all the um interesting um reflections of society of all the time when it was made and how it evolved and etc and then here we are in the 21st century with with our audience and our dancers and um so it's going to be very very exciting i think okay. it was Mingwei was asked the question he had rewritten something like 32 times or something mm -hmm. the final page of a book or and someone said why why did you do that and he said to get the words right it's quite it's that simple it's it's as important how you say something as what you're saying because it's it's open to interpretation, so you have to be specific about what it is you want to say, and at the same time guide the audience a little bit into what you want them to understand that you're saying, mm -hmm. not just you didn't say this the same way as I saw it in the Bolshoi production three years ago. So what's up with that? You want them to say, oh, I like the way you said what you said in that scene. Mm -hmm. Now, Victor, Julie mentioned the mime scene um, in Act Two. So pantomime clearly plays such an important part in these Petipa ballets. And it was, the pantomime has been, was taken out sort of during the Soviet era and Soviet productions. And even during some of the ABT productions, there's not as much as we see now in contemporary versions. Could you talk a little bit about um, pantomime and how it helps tell the story in, in ballets like Swan Lake and Sleeping Beauty? Yeah, um, I it's important to be very concise with it so that an audience can follow it and understand it. But at the same time, there has to be nuance. Um, so when you're doing mime, it's very similar to doing a, a character. You have to have sort of mini layers and then distill it down to the most important, but the layers still need to be there. So if you, my analogy is if you look at a, a painting by a master, there's so much knowledge there of how to use color and when to bring in and, and how the light is used. But when, when a museum goer or a theater goes to see something, you don't expect them to understand and analyze what the color and where the light is coming from and how they use certain colors to infuse the painting. You just go and see it and go, what a magnificent painting. An art historian would go and say, oh, such and such a Van Gogh or a, or a Rubens or a, a Leonardo used color in this way and that way and light in this way and that way to achieve an effect. The nuance is there and the layering is there and the knowledge is there and then it gets distilled down so it looks like one beautiful thing like a tapestry which is, which is woven together. So you see a picture of a unicorn sitting inside of a circle and anybody can understand what that is. They don't necessarily need to understand how it was constructed um, in order to appreciate its beauty. And so with the mime, we have to be very clear to carry the story from A to B to C to D so an audience can follow it so that they care about the characters. Mm -hmm. If someone comes to the theater and sits down and goes, that's the good guy, that's the bad guy, either the bad guy is going to win or the good guy is going to win then they, they should they may as well just go home if they're not interested in the character and the and go um in one way or another i feel sympathy for what's going to happen and by the time i get to the second act or the end of the third act i really care about that character and about what happens to them not always in a good sense you know the fairy tales either have have basically they're all or nothing they either end in in complete happiness or sort of complete destruction Mm -hmm. And you want the audience to take that journey so that by the time that absolute end happens, that they're invested in it. And the mime is very important that because obviously in ballet to tell a story, we don't have words. We just have gestures. So gestures have to be very simple and very concise, but very poignant. And they have to have meaning. They can't just be thrown away. Um, it's like somebody mumbling their sentences and you can't understand what they say after a very short time, you sort of stop listening. 
So we have to be very careful that the audience keeps listening to us in those mime scenes. So it carries the story forward so that they care about the character so that they laugh or cry at the end of the ballet. Put it in simple terms. And there was a recent Washington Ballet post by Adelaide Klaus, one of our dancers, um, who who was coached by Julie in the role of Odette Odile. And she talks about the pantomime, the language of pantomime, that it doesn't necessarily follow the same order that we would expect. You know, I walk here, it may be I hear walk. Could you talk a little bit about how how that works? Um, yes. Well, I I think. Um, Oh, that is uh, not not unlike other languages where <laughs> the verb is before the pronoun. Um, right. So Russian, like <laughs> like Yavash uh, Lublu, I love you, but it says I you love. Exactly. So exactly. maybe that's where mine comes from. <laughs> so, but I think the. Um, yeah, it's like learning another language and like any language you have to speak uh, to be understood as everything that Victor said, mm -hmm. clearly, distinctly, not in one tempo in order to be expressive, make your point. You can't, you know, it has to be like a language and, and every gesture has to have the feeling, have to, has to have words. So Georgina always would make me say, well, at the beginning when I was learning, whatever I wanted, whatever our, my intention was, uh, the gestures had words. Mm -hmm. um, so that it it had that, as Victor put so well, that, that dynamic that it wasn't just um, gestures, but you, it was a window into who that character is mm -hmm. and why you end up falling in love with them or, or caring about whether they live or die or ha happy, tragic. Um, and, and that's really what mime does. It allows those little windows into uh, the individual, into the character. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it, for some people, you know, it, it, unless you, uh, unless you approach it with that kind of, um, dramatic and artistic mind, it can just be empty gestures. And that's why I think it's often <laughs> cut. But uh, from our, our approach, and as I said, Victor has been a huge artistic influence on me since I was a very young dancer. And so understanding um, how to take advantage of all that's at your disposal as an artist um, and in these ballets, it's just so important. And mime is a very big part of that. We also, as human beings, have a history of, of I think, understanding body language very clearly. Mm -hmm. You're walking on the street and you see someone suspicious or you see someone that looks happy or you see someone that's euphoric in a normal sense of the word. Or a puppy comes to you and wags the tail. Mm -hmm. You have a, re a visceral response to that. And when we're using body language and mind to describe something, people watching that, again, whether they have a history of it and a sense of knowing exactly what the mind means, should be able to understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so when you teach it, when you teach dance from one generation to the next, you teach the steps, but just doing the steps ain't dancing. <laughs> just to teach somebody to make gestures that says I, you, love, and say, no, it looks like you're saying I touch myself and then I point at you and then I touch my <laughs> chest. Chest doesn't really resonate with an audience. Mm -hmm. They have to, they have to and, and people do have an internal understanding of body language about whether someone is reticent or in your face or neutral or whether or not they have great energy around them and you want to share that energy or it's a negative energy, not to get too esoteric about it, but we do understand and we respond viscerally to things that um, attract us or repulse us. And mime is very much the same thing. When you're watching it, you should be able to understand it um, in the context of, of the scene that it's happening in. I'm not saying that someone would understand every gesture, but they should be able to understand the body language. 
and they should feel drawn in by it so that they want to see what those gestures are going to, what consequence those gestures are going to have next, or they don't care, and then they're not engaged in the story. So it's very important for the story ballets that that mind be very precise. And the analogy to teaching the steps is not the same as dancing. Teaching someone the gestures is not the same as teaching them what they're saying. So we always put words to what they're saying so that they understand. And sometimes just the nuance of how much time you take or where you pause is very important. And if they don't know what they're saying, and then they have to feel and believe what they're saying, and then the gestures become convincing. Now, Victor, why is it so important for our generation of Washington ballet dancers to learn this classical repertory of the Petit Bas ballets? Well, as I said earlier, the education I got from having done so many roles in it, um, I think has, has suited me very well in terms of my uh, emotional attachment to the art form. And uh, these ballets that go from A to Z over the course of two or two and a half hours have a real trajectory that you have to be able to follow through as a performer. And if you don't understand what's going on on stage and what's the, whether it's whether it moves the story forward or not, of course it does in the terms of Swan Lake when you've got um, you know Spanish dancers and Chardosh dancers, it represents realms of different people that from which the prince is supposed to to um, you know pick a princess. Um, they have some meaning in that sense, but they also have to be they also have to be entertaining and um, accessible to the audience in different ways so if they just if an audience just comes and says all i really care about is the is the white act part of the, and the second act and the black swan part of the, in the fourth act and the rest of the stuff is not entertaining or or doesn't mean anything then you have a pretty weak performance and so to be able to teach the dancers how important every aspect and every element of a of a any ballet is not just a story ballet I think is very important. And these are sort of the basics, like um, what are the basic ingredients for uh, some great French dish? Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, don't make a, you don't make a beef bourguignon with uh, some leftover hot dogs and, and um, some onions. You have to have exactly the right <laughs> ingredients and then how you put them together and how you present them and how you serve them and what kind of wine you put with them and mm -hmm. what you preface and use for dessert all, all makes a big difference. So you can't say someone's a great chef unless they understand those things. So these ballets give us an opportunity to basically take the dancers to cooking school and go, this is how you make this, and this is how you make this, and this is how you make this, in terms of the ingredients, and then how you interpret the ingredients and serve them, that's gonna be up to you. But that's what's gonna make you an artist or a great chef or just a cook or just a dancer. And Julie, do you have any thoughts on that experience as well, on, on your role now as coaching your next generation of Odettes and Odiels? I mean, for me, I just, um, you know, I, I want to impart my love of all of these ballets uh, into the hearts and minds of our dancers and our audience, you know, and um, they, they, we, we train, generations of dancers in this um in this vocabulary of movement um classical ballet and these ballets all have all those steps that we've been practicing since we were children and so it's it's a, just an, an exquisite culmination of <clears throat> of all the training, all the, all the elements of being a ballet dancer, which is, you know, artist, athlete, actor, um, performer. And um, it's, they're, 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 it, they're just a very, um, one of the most fulfilling experiences of a professional career is to mm -hmm. dance in one of these productions. And you you also become a repository of information. Mm -hmm. Dancers teach the next generation of dancers what they've learned and what they know, and that generation teaches the next generation. You can't go and get the the 
dance score to most ballets, the mm-hmm. dance steps mm-hmm. score to most ballets, and you certainly can't get the emotional content. You have to learn it and you have to teach it. And it can't in with us, the generation of dancers that we have contact with have to learn from us and be inspired so that they can teach and inspire the next generation. Um, so that's also very, very important for us. You have to share the knowledge that you've gained from your, from, you know, 40 or 50 years of working at something. Well, it's very exciting that you're all back in the studio with the dancers able to impart that knowledge <clears throat> in person. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing the fruit of your labor for Swan Lake next year. Um, and we have some really wonderful questions that have been coming in. So first we have um, a question from Leanne Boland. How important to the performance are the costume and set design? You mentioned Zach Brown. Do you have a favorite Swan Lake set production? Who will design the Washington Ballet's Swan Lake? Right. Well, <clears throat> set design and production are very important for the artist um, uh, because it's part of it's part of how you're telling the story, right? So um, I, I think that uh, I've had some wonder, we've had wonder dance in wonderful productions. Um, uh, Santa Laquasto is a fa- favorite designer of ours. Of course, uh, Georgiadis also is in, uh, uh, one of the best. Um, the Washington Ballet Swan Lake production will be uh, most likely uh, the production from Ballet West. Uh, until we're in a position to commission our own, a financial position to commission our own sets and costumes, which we would hope in the future would be possible. Um, We will be finding the production that fits in the Kennedy Center Eisenhower Theater. So these these are the logistics that most people wouldn't know about it. Not uh, most productions uh, of Swan Lake size are built for very large um, theater. And so finding productions that you can scale down to a smaller proscenium stage like uh, the Eisenhower Theater where we perform um, is a challenge. So there's not a whole, <laughs> and besides the, the the budget size for these productions. So um, sort of you, you do the best you can with whatever ingredients you have. So. Yeah, and I would I would add that you um, we're a smaller company than the Bolshoi, for instance, and so we're not going to do that same production. It would be like uh, going into your parents' closet, putting on their shoes, and clomping around the house. <laughs> they just don't fit. They just don't fit. And then if you take into consideration that really to put together a Swan Lake from start to finish these days would probably cost in the neighborhood of five six million dollars. And uh, that's a lot of money for a small company. So what you do is find a production, and by production, Julie means the physical production, not the not the staging itself, um, but the physical production that suits you and your company. And then you make some adjustments to it, and you add some costumes, and you make it fit your company. Um, and I thought we were very successful with that with Sleeping Beauty. I thought it fit just beautifully. Um, even though we rented the actual physical production, we altered it in some ways to make it our own and, uh, it fit beautifully and it fit the space that we did it in beautifully. Um, that's my opinion, but I think it was shared by many others. And so it's going to be the same with Swan Lake. We're going to make it look like it was created from start to finish for Washington Ballet. We have a question also from our composer, Blake. Have you ever asked a conductor to slow down? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> I mean, I think I can't, I can't. Uh, each ballerina and prince has their own tempo. And so that relationship between the conductor and um, the the dancer is so important. and. Um, you know, we would obviously Maestro Charles Barker was one of my all time favorite conductors, um, <clears throat> because he was obviously with me from my, we joined American Ballet Theater at the same time. So our careers have been parallel. 
Um, but his sensitivity and understanding of what um, each individual artist needs and, uh, and without indulging to a point that it's just, um, it's not, it's compromising the bigger picture. So, but yes, the nuance and tempo is so important. Um, but no, but no less important than the music itself. So you always have to defer to the conductor. I've never said to someone, you need to slow this down. I've said, do you think it would be okay musically to give us a little bit more time here? Because I can't get from over there to over here in the amount of time I've been allowed. So do you think you could stretch it out a little bit? And they say that's really a bad place to stretch it out. So you try to figure out a compromise. But it's very much like dancing with a partner. There's a give and take there. And you have to have the, the conductor has to have the respect for the dance art form. And the dancer has to have respect for the music art form so that they can sing together. And I will say I've seen some performances that look like the music was just background noise that was was going was going along while someone danced because they weren't in sync with the conductor and obviously on what either one wanted to do. So it's a, it's a compromise and a collaboration always. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have, oh, Tony Stefano has a question. Given your take on the joy of women in groups, will Odette still swim by day in the Lake of Tears? Yes. <laughs> in a word? Yes. <laughs> yes, they will be by the lake. Because there will be swans, and so they will do better in a lake than in the desert mm -hmm. or the mountains. Exactly. <laughs> we got to keep that keep that aspect. Hi, Martha. So we have a question for Martha for Julie. Did you use any mental or physical exercise between acts acts two and three to affect transformation from vulnerable Odette mm -hmm. and dazzling reveal? Well, to be honest, you're so busy changing your costume, your makeup, your hair, your headpiece, your you know taking the what the all those things have a ton of bobby pins. <laughs> I'm taking all the bobby pins out and changing your lips, put on more lipstick, more color on your face for Odile. The actual transformation physically is costume, makeup, tiara. And I used to change my hairstyle also, um, not in Kevin's because the headdress was designed specifically for one hairstyle, but in the in the David Blair production, I would do a French twist, so a higher, higher, more elegant hairstyle for the third act, and then back to the low bun for the lakeside scenes, which is a lot <laughs> of brushing, combing, putting hair in. Um, I think you're, you know, you're trained as a dancer to do the whole ballet in an hour rehearsal, all, you know, all your dancing parts. And so the, so much of how you um, change characters is in the physicality and, and the mindset. So it doesn't take uh, in the performance, you rely on that training. Um, and then it's just about the focus, right? You just, you know how to go where you need to go very quickly. And, as always, the music, the atmosphere, the commitment of the people around you, the story that you're telling um, becomes, and your partner, <laughs> number one, um, help that transformation um, happen. So, If you would wander into Julie's dressing room before act two and again before act three, you would see two completely different characters mm -hmm. taking shape as the hair goes and the <laughs> makeup goes and the costume goes, you see that. 180 transformation. I love that. So I think we have time for one last question. Let's see, um, a Balatoman question. What do you think of the Marinsky version with a happy ending? Well, um, I I haven't, uh, I, in, in Finland uh, with the Russian Imperial Ballet, we danced the Soviet version that was really, a, it was a non-ending. It sort of just, Von Rothbard kind of went away, but the swan and the prince just, we just kind of finished sort of standing next to each other looking out. Yeah, but it was a bit unclear of kind of what happened. Um, 
versus all the other uh, production live dance where, you know, Von Rothbart was destroyed or in Misha's production, we literally, trans we woke up as we were swans and then all of a sudden we were maidens sort of looking at each other and touching each other and like wondering what happened to, you know, what, what was the cause of this transformation in ourselves. Uh, and then in Kevin's production where it's clearly they jump off to their death and then they're un united in the afterlife. And uh, so, um, I, you know, I, I don't, to me, the music doesn't say happy ending. Um, <laughs> uh, and I haven't, I have not seen the Marinsky uh, fourth act in a long time. And so I, I wouldn't, not quite sure. I don't see how Swan Lake, I don't see how what happens to lead up to the end could possibly be a happy ending, <laughs> but I wouldn't credit, you know, anyone can do their production as they wish, but I would prefer not to see a Sleeping Beauty that had a, a tragic ending as well. Like if they got married and then they jumped off a cliff, I would probably say not my favorite Sleeping Beauty <laughs> because, because this whole story hasn't led up to that. But, you know, anything is, anything is valid. It's, maybe it's just a question of personal taste or emotional taste. Well, we're so thrilled to see the ending of Swan Lake next year. Uh, we're very much looking forward to the return to theater. Thank you so much to Julie and Victor for this incredibly insightful, impactful discussion of Swan Lake and the entire legacy of Patipa. Thank you to our Balletamon Society, our subscribers and our donors for your continued commitment to the Washington Ballet. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on May 21st for our next episode of Bar Talk. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.